Making comments in your Bible is maybe one of the most important things you can do as you study God's word. I'm not going to sit here and make a case for why I think you should write in your Bibles. I'm assuming you're already here because you want to find ways to make comments on the text that you're reading that are meaningful, impactful, and are going to help you learn more. How's it going, everyone? My name is Pastor Jeremy, and welcome to Genuine JC. And on this channel, it's my goal to help you learn the Bible and how to study it, and that's exactly what we're doing here. You may have come from the previous videos. If not, you can check the playlist down in the description, walking through some of these different ways to build out a full four-part system of outlining, commenting, defining, and linking. Now I'm going to break down the way that I make comments. And these are not just, wow, that's amazing, or this is how it applies to my life today, or that's really cool. Instead, these are comments directed towards the main goal of getting to the meaning of the text. That if you look through your comments in your text, you're going to get ideas to meaning. What you're trying to do is to write down an observation that gets at meaning because when you come back to this text, the work that you're putting in today is going to pay dividends in the future. So let's get in and I'm going to show you what I do. So once you've outlined your text, and you've done that in black, I use alternating red and blue pens to mark up my comments. There is no significance to which one is red and which one is blue, other than I try to alternate so that it's really easy to see on the page what comment and what the order of the comments are in so that it doesn't get confusing and cluttered. And if I'm using one color to make a whole bunch of different comments, where does that start? Where does that stop? Do I have to make boxes around everything? Do I have to highlight this? And I'm going for simple here red and blue alternating and I simply underline what I'm commenting on with an arrow pointing there. That way if I wanted a comment to cover two different highlights or two different underlines of the same text, I could do that easily by just drawing two lines and writing one block of text. I've already outlined the text. I've already come to the main theme of the text. I've already come to some of the subheadings of the text and now it's time to go back through read again the text, which I've done multiple times at this point, all to try and find not just what sticks out to me. That's not what I'm doing here. Instead, where do I think some clarity is helpful? And this is where using study Bibles and other resources and commentaries can come into play as you're building out some of these meanings. Future Jeremy here, and I just want to make this point because I didn't make it so clearly in the video. You don't need Bible commentaries or even a study Bible to do some of this because we're talking about getting to the plain meaning of a text. Now, when you get to things you don't understand, don't just put down what you think if you're confused. That's when you should go look at these other resources. You should check out what theologians have said who have studied the original languages, who have done that work that may not be able to be done by you just yet. But you don't have to start there. Just wanted to point that out. Back to the video now. Here in James 1, I have made a number of different comments, and I'm not going to read through every comment here on the page. If you want to pause the video and read the comments, you can do that. But I don't want to take that much time. I just want to get you the understanding of how to do this. I'll read through and I'll think different things. How do I want to talk about this? What needs said? Looking at commentaries, the first comment I mentioned here is in regards to verse 2. It says, "Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith brings about perseverance." Now, here in verse 2, I actually made two separate comments. And you can see that clearly. Why? Because one is in red, one is in blue. If I needed to make a third comment, well, then maybe I would bring in a third color, but I haven't needed to do that yet, and I really don't want to make that much clutter. Plus, there may not even be that much room unless you have a wide margin Bible or an ESV journaling Bible or something along those lines. What are the two comments I made here? I said, Paul does not give a single exception to this rule. So this is an observation that's pointing us to a meaning. Consider it all joy. He doesn't say consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, except... 
this trial, this trial, this trial, this trial, this trial. So this is an observation of what Paul isn't saying. There is not a trial that we shouldn't be able to count as joy. Uh, I underlined testing of your faith. Now, this comment came, and I distinctly remember this when I was looking at my CSB Spurgeon Study Bible. This comment came from one of the things Charles Spurgeon said, and I thought it was super applicable to get to the meaning underneath this text. What does it say? The testing of your faith brings about perseverance. I wrote, faith is the target of the enemy. Now, again, this is an observation pointing to a meaning. You can see how some of these are observations, and you'll see some later get to that just plain meanings of the text. But when you start to put together observations and comments about meaning, you can build out the understanding and an interpretation and eventually an application of the text. So what do I mean by that? Or what did Spurgeon mean by that? It's this idea of faith is the thing. Our trust in God is the thing that gets pinpointed and tested. Now, does the rest of this passage have anything to say about faith? And we'll see how that goes. It says lacking wisdom is the, is the main heading that I've given it as my outline. Why? Because Yes, it's talking about trials and joy. However, what's the solution to being able to count it all joy is this wisdom that Paul is talking about. If any of you lacks wisdom, the wise one is able to count it all joy. This is less of a comment of observation and more now getting to the between the lines meaning of the text that when we have wisdom... The wise one is able to count it joy. Why? Where's that wisdom coming from? Well, let's keep reading and see what that says. It says, verse 5, Let him ask of God who gives all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. And again, I've underlined there. So you can see, bit by bit, I'm going through this. It doesn't mean I'm fully underlining every verse and making a comment on every verse. It might be a part of that verse, but a part of that or a phrase or a word uh, like you saw in verse 2 uh, or here in verse 8, unstable in all his ways. And even though, here's a good reason why red and blue, to give you an idea, that's underlined by red, and it's on the right side of the page. So you would think, oh, maybe I should go to the right side of the page to see what that comment is. No, because you can see the arrow here in the red is where that comment is associated with. So what was that comment? When we trust God, we are mature and stable. The, it, this idea of lacking wisdom, gaining wisdom from God, brings about stability. And so when he Paul's talking about the instability of the one who lacks wisdom, the inverse of that is true, that when we receive wisdom from God, we are stable. As you start to build these comments, I've given you examples. Take your time, read the passage, read a commentary, and then what comes to the surface is that observation and meaning, write a comment about that. You might be able to come back and add more comments again later. We're not building a, a theological work or I'm not going to be writing my own commentary here on the book of James. My purpose is to study God's word, to learn it more effectively. And so when I open up back to James or I'm a visual learner. I don't know about you. If you're a visual learner, you know what I'm going to be able to visualize? It's so much easier for me to remember an idea, a comment, a word when I'm closing my eyes and I say, oh, it's on the right side of the page. It was a blue comment on the right side of the page. You might laugh, but it's little things like that that can trigger memory. And so what's the goal? It's to be doers of the word and to be doers of the word. We have to know the word. And so knowing the word entails memorizing, remembering, studying. We're not just studying all of this stuff just to have head knowledge to know things. Instead, we're doing it because the word of God is active and living, sharper than any two-edged sword. It transforms and changes and molds our hearts into the likeness of Christ. That my life, your life, will transform. Why? Because of God's holy word. You are now ready to jump in and start making comments in the scriptures. And I'm so excited for you that this will hopefully help you in your time of study. 
hit that like button if you haven't already. And if you want to see the other videos in this series and the next one talking about how to define words in the text, well, click on the playlist right there. I'll catch you on the next one. Remember, faithfulness is pursued together. Peace.